Hi. Uh, I'd like to thank Hamza for inviting us to this beautiful city. I love this for the last few days. Um, so I'm going to talk about fishing. This is about studying the debug information. Uh, at Google, I've been working with Doug Evans and Sterling Arts to, to uh, try to improve the usability and the likability of our files. The, the ultimate goal for us is that we want debug info all the time. We want to be able to turn it on for everything. You know, whatever anybody does a build, we want to have a debug info with it so that we can debug it when we need it. But the big problem with that is we have a lot of apps. We have a lot of big, big apps. And these are C++ apps. So I'm going to be focusing here mostly on C++, all the figures that I'm done using are basically measured with C++ applications. Um, and when we link the, when we try to link these apps, the debug info contributes a lot of storage. So it expands the total size of the .o file, so we have to link it by about five minutes. That's a huge amount. That means 80% of what we're linking is debugging now. Um, and when we have a distributed, when we have a distributed build system, that means we have to ship all those .o files out to the link server and link them and then ship the result back to the to the uh, we tried using compressed debug info uh, about a year or two ago, and that improved things by 30 to 40 percent. That got us to the point where some links that were failing with out of memory conditions on the distributed build system, that got us to the point where those links could start working again. But after a year or so, the applications kept growing, and they started running out of memory conditions again. So we realized we needed an order of magnitude solution to the problem. Stripping the debug info out of the data files, putting them somewhere else where they don't have to be linked. A secondary problem that we've been having, maybe not really a secondary problem for your GP user, is the GP time domain is just way too long. And part of that is due to um, the total size of the debug info and the executable. So, one thing that we found helps, really helps there is the capacity of the index. And we experimented with using the GP index that uh, Tom Charlie did. And by putting that in the link step, having the linker app actually generate the GB index, that made a big improvement in GB startup time. It got us from basically what it took to go something that was measured in minutes to something that was measured in seconds. So that's a big improvement. Uh, but there's still more improvement to be had by lowering the amount of debugging so that it has to process that startup. And our solution to that is to split the bulk of the debugging info out of the file, out of the .o files so they don't have to be linked, and they don't have to be in the file executable. And basically all we're left with in the executable is basically you know, a small skeleton of debug info with an index. So here we have the, the .o files. And after compression, it helped a lot with the debug info. It saved us quite a bit of stuff. But you can see we're still taking an awful lot of space with the debug info. So all this stuff uh, from the gold bar up is debug info. So we've got our text and data, we've got overhead. Most of the overhead, by the way, is for uh, section tables and, and stuff uh, because we have a lot of content sections. This is C++, right? We have a lot of content sections, um, especially for debug types and also <coughs> for you know, templates and inline functions and things like that. So that's, that adds a lot of space in, in the uh, data files. But above that, we have uh, debug info, we have a lot of debug strings. And because they're compressed sections, the strings compress the most. So we get a, we get a lot of savings there from compressing the string types. But the relocations don't compress all. We don't compress the relocations. So we still have it. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Maybe you we've, we've, you should be. We've thought about it, but that's, that's, uh, that was still linked in considerably. Um, so, but you know, aside from compressing the relocations, what we looked at was a lot of those relocations are for references to strings in the string table, in the debug string table specifically. And we realized that we could get rid of a lot of those relocations. So the, the first step that we wanted to do was do something about the string, the string relocations. So one of the observations we made was the relocations for debug info is still is more than half of the total debug info that's in the relocatable object files. And strings, they count for 10% of the total size, that's after compression. Um, 
With compression, they're a little bit bigger than that uh, in terms of percentage. And references to strings, however, nine out of ten of the relocations are references to debug strings. So we realize that if we can get half a load, if we can get most of those relocations, then we have a we have a good solution to the problem, at least in our get rid of relocations. We also found that line number tables, range lists, location lists, the, the little dwarf tables on the side, they're pretty small relative to debug info. In fact, they're almost inconsequential. One thing we found out is as this optimization gets bigger, gets better and better, uh, the location list and the relocation associated with the location list keep growing. So we, when I we first did my, um, my estimates about a year ago um, of how much I'd be able to save by some of the plans that I've been talking about here, I had uh, fairly large estimates and we haven't been able to hit those targets simply because optimization has gotten better. <laughs> And it's introduced more and more relocations, and more and more location lists, and uh, more relocations associated with those. But we're, we still got a pretty substantial improvement here. So the first thing we wanted to do um, really was generate a link time for the index. So part of that problem there is that linking, building the JP index at link time from the raw debug info was really slow. Um, I tried. I think there, there's still things that I can do to make the linker faster there, but I hit all the uh, low hanging fruit and it's still way too slow. So we wanted to take the approach of processing the pub names tables. Now ideally, pub names tables were designed so that they could be used directly to the debugger. All the linker would have to do is throw them all together, put them in the output file, and it would have the fast linker tables there. But in practice, GDB has is, is, is never actually implemented uh, pub names tables. Um, partly because they're um, not reliable. Uh, there's been a lot of bugs that you see not generating the things, not generating the code names correctly. And then there's also expectations that you see that it expects things in code names that a literal reading of the dwarf spec would leave you believe we're not supposed to be there. So there's some things we need to clean up. Dwarf spec, we need to work on this problem. A fast look at it. But we did try going with uh, building the GDB index directly at link time. And one thing we found is that if we can fix the pub names tables in GCC, and then read those in the linker, we, we can build a GDB index much more efficiently. And then we, we present to the debugger a nice, uh, efficiently organized GDB index. And one thing that we'd like to consider in the future uh, for Dwarf 5 is actually building something better than what we have now. Debug pub names, pub types, A ranges um, are just not very good for GDB. Um, we want something a little bit better, something more like GDB index in terms of speed of access. Um, but probably something in terms of the of space is GDB index. The second thing we wanted to do was eliminate those relocations to strings. So the, the obvious approach was say, well, you know, a reference to the, these strings are, um, can be implicitly really good. You, you can go through the dwarf and you can see a, a, a DW form stir P and know that the thing that follows it is an offset to something in the string table. And you, know, you could tell the linker that, okay, you know, parse the debug info, find all those DW, DW form stir P's, and just implicitly relocate them. You don't actually need to materialize the location without a file. But again, you're asking the linker to parse debug info. So what we decided to do was uh, collect all the string offsets into a separate table. And then in the dwarf info itself, we replaced the DW form stir P, which was just a relocated uh, four byte offset to the string table. Replace that with a fixed LAB128 encoding of a slot in the string offsets table. So um, even if you leave the relocations on the string offsets table, we're still coalescing a lot of multiple references to strings into single reference. So string offsets can have one entry per unique string in the string table, whereas in the dwarf info we had multiple references to each string. Lots of them, lots of strings were referenced many, many times within the debug info. So this gives us a savings right off just simply by reducing the number rather than just eliminating it. 
But another thing we can do is say, okay, defect store offsets is nothing but a series of four byte offsets that can be implicitly relocated. So we can either do that um, and have the linker implicitly relocate them, or we can leave them out of the debug, out of the .o files entirely, and split them off into a separate file, and let the debugger do that relocation. So we have we have a couple of options here, and I've sort of organized this so you can go along the scale as much as you want to, and stop wherever you want to, uh, and, and get the, the kind of result that that, uh, that you need. Uh, we wanted to go all the way and get the debug info completely out of the .os, so that's where we're going after this. So to do that, we have a new, a new uh, attribute in the compiling die, DWAT stir base. Um, when we, if we, if we separate the debug we don't actually need this, but if we leave the uh, string, the relocation of the string offsets in the .o files, we need a stir base which basically says where the beginning of that compilation unit's contributions to the string offsets take and once you've got that address, that's one relocation, once you've got that, then all those other string offset, all the other um, um, slot indexes in the debug info can just go relevant to that. And so we've eliminated all but just one relocation. Then we have a new form code, DW form stir index, which replaces DW form stir P in the debug info. That provides the index of the string offset table, and then the string offset table gives you the actual address. So we've added one extra level of direction in order to, to, to achieve this saving of applications. This, the next step is to isolate references to little segments. So I've taken care of the references to string tables. Um, that's basically debug to debug references. And that was, so that was one source of relocation that was 9 out of 10 of relocations. The rest of our relocations um, are basically references to little segments with the exception of a very few of the other other debug references um, to all of us. But all the references to local segments basically means that we want to, we need to have relocations in the debug info. And that makes it difficult to split the debug info out into a separate file that we're not going to send to the limit. Because otherwise your previous approaches to, to splitting this out had said, okay, the, we have to put index information, load map information basically in the executable so the debugger can then go figure out how to apply the relocations. And that means you have to keep the relocations around. The debugger has to go through the trouble of you know, processing it. So by splitting, by pulling those relocations out of the debug info, similar to the way we did with strings, we replace a relocatable, four or eight byte relocatable address of the debug info with an LAB128 slot index. That, ad, that index is in a slot in the debug, in the new debug adder section. And we leave that section in the .o file. That gets sent to the linker, all the relocations get applied to that, and all the debugger has to do is take an index from the, the separate debug file, follow it over to the executable, and pull the address out. So we achieve savings here um, by, again, by coalescing multiple references to the same address. So to do this, we have to add a new attribute to the companion of die, sort of like we did with the strings. So we have an adder base attribute. And its value points to the base of the companion of contributions to debug adder. We have another attribute similarly uh, for ranges space. So the ranges table also stays in the other files because that's full of relocations. Um, so we have a, a ranges space attribute that tells us the beginning of that compiles contributions to the ranges table. And then all the real, all the references to range tables in the debug info, they basically stay as they are, but we can omit the relocations. Instead of making them a relocatable pointer into, into the debug ranges section, we simply make them an offset relative to the beginning of the contribution. And then the, the debugger can take that offset, add the value of ranges base to it, and find the ranges that you're looking for. We have a new form code, uh, formatter index, and that basically works the same as uh, stir, the stir index form that we had on the previous slide. Um, it indexes a slot in the address table, and then we, add, we basically add the extra level of direction for the debugger. So for the debugger 
Um, and then, similarly, we have locationless, location expressions. So we have DWR battery packs, um, which serves the same purpose.
Then once we've done all that, we're ready to split the divided product. Now when we're left with, uh, well, there's one more thing. So for references to ranges and debug ranges, we just, I mentioned this before, we have to use the raw unrelocated offsets instead of the bigger location. Once we've done that, we've gotten rid of all the relocations in the debug info and the debug type sections. And we can just put those out into a separate file that doesn't need to be like So what we do is we take all these sections, debug rev, info types, local stir, stir offsets, and then either back into our macro, depending on what we're going to see. Um, and put those into a separate DW file. And the way we do that is we, we just put a .pwo at the end of each name. And then we, after the assembly step, we run object copy twice. We have object copy to pull all the DW sections out into a separate file. And we run object copy again to remove them from the .pwo file. And that leaves us with two files as a result of the calculation step. Then one more thing we have to do is leave a skeleton behind of the debug info and debug type sections. So for each debug, for each compile unit, and for each type unit in the original file, we leave a skeleton debug line in the debug section in the DW file. Um, and that uh, skeleton section basically provides the index information that we need. So that has the computer attribute. Um, so you, have, you know the compilation there just by looking at executable. It has a statement list because we left the lines table in the data file. It has LocuC, IPC, and DVAT ranges so that we can use those attributes to build a GD index. It has DWO name and or DWO ID. The, ID, the DWO ID is just a 64-bit hash of the, uh, of the debug info so that we can use it to verify that once we find a DWO name, it actually is the right file. So DWO name basically points us to the DWO file, and that's sitting in the compile tree in the build tree. And so the D, if you run GDB on the linked executable, it will have, for each compilation unit, it will have a pointer to the name, uh, to the DWO file by name. We also have an adder base and ranges based attributes so that you can take the slot indexes and actually find the slot that you're, that you're trying to reference. And then in the .o file, we also keep the, the skeleton info and type sections, a debug or rev section for those skeletons. Um, and then lines, ranges, and uh, the lines and ranges stay in the .o, just they're basically unchanged. Debug adder we've added is new, that stays in the .o. Pub names and pub types, we're going to leave those are basically index information. And rather than leave them there for GDB, we actually process them by linker. And the debug IP ranges is kind of the ugly stepchild here. Nobody really uses it. Um, we have the we, we collect the range information from the compilation index that when we build the GDB index at one time. Um, the debugger doesn't use the ranges, so we basically leave that in that file if we generate it, and then we strip it out. <laughs> <laughs> then the next step is. So all that's fine and good when you're uh, debugging in, in the build tree. But if you want to ship an executable off somewhere, ship it out to production or ship it to a customer or whatever, you want to be able to ship the debug info with it. You don't want to just have to build up a tar file of all those that need to go files that are sitting in the build tree. So we have, we're working on a tool, this is, this is the part that's not quite finished yet. Uh, we're working on a tool that will take, you point it at an executable, you'll find it. The list of DWO files that have to collect, package them all up into one handy executable. And along the way, it's going to eliminate duplicate types the same way that we eliminate duplicate types at the time today before the fiction. And it can do the merge of string tables. So there's going to be a lot of the string table um, savings in the executable because we can merge all the duplicate strings. In the C++ apps, there are all the strings. So, those are two things that we really want to do and then we get the, the uh, what we incorporate or the DWB file down to the manageable size. So is that like linking the DWO files into a single file or do they remain separate? This is essentially a separate list. It's kind of like Apple to send it. Well, well it, it would be a much simpler like that. And unlike, you know, we've thought about trying to coalesce like here to 
start going steps pre specialist But you end up with problems there where you don't really know when you search archive libraries, you don't know what needs to be there to see the whole file. But this, you know, this can be sharded. We don't have to know about archive libraries or anything. We know all the DW files we take. We can take a subset of them, combine them together, take another subset, combine those together, and then combine the results. And we can do that on you know, multiple levels, however we need. And we can keep that link step down to a medical size. And then optionally, we can run Yakub's uh, DWZ utility, uh, or you know, sort of bundle it into our package utility. So we're definitely excited about that. Uh, we can do a lot of optimization on the DWZ on that. So, so far, We've managed to split the .o files down to a little bit less than half the size of their original. We're talking about compressed values here. <laughs> this is the original part that I showed in the earlier graph. Um, this, is, this is kind of a lot of good results. <laughs> um, so it's very early results here. We still have a lot of allocations in the, uh, the .o files. Um, and those are for debug error, the debug error section. Do you have um, a lot of redundant debug info? And have you put that out your impact for templates that aren't used? Or? Well, you know, most of the redundant info we have is for types. And that we, you know, with the debug type stuff that, that I did a few years ago, we've been able to eliminate most of the debug most of the debug types. And with DWO files, we're not really doing that until the packaging stuff. That's what we're going to do. So the uh, total size of DOS here does reflect I've looked at uh, the, the amount of duplicate information we get because of templates and, and inline functions, and it's not really that significant. Most of it is because of that. Um, so notice debug adder doesn't show up right in the data, so it's because we're talking about compressed files. Debug adder is nothing but zeros, right? Because it's the relocations that count. So that's the way that we today. Debug adder is, is zero size. So it's when we uh, translate that over to the executable, you see the big address is fairly significant size. The DWO files are pretty good now. They're less than half the size of that other. They're about, if you look at the total size of debug info in the .os, compare with the total size of debug info in the .dws, right now it's about 50-50. And how to do better. I want to get more in the DWO, less in the other. So it's still working on that. And when we look at the executable, You'll see the, uh, the light purple there is debug adder. That's still the biggest part. Uh, GDB index is almost as big as probably, probably about the same. So GDB index is big. Um, we know that's, that, that definitely was not designed for space efficiency. So there's lots of things we could do for GDB index to make it yes. six bits or values for many things. Yeah. So there's lots of things we can do. And, and we, have, we want to work with the Dwarf Committee to try to come up with a, with a real design for Dwarf 5 for better fast and better things. And we'll just move along with the index and stuff that. But debug adder still is bigger than we want it to be. And there's still a lot of implications. Um, I'll tell you about that here on uh, a couple of slides later. The uh, status right now is we've, we've submitted all the GCC patches. We've got all of the last one. That the last one's still on the uh, We've got GDB support already committed to Trump. Uh, we've got the gold support for the GDB index committed to Trump. Um, one of the GDB pack or one of the GCC patches that went in, uh, it had us change the, uh, the way we did pub names, the DWDT pub names to let us find associated uh, IAS with pub names. So there's a change there, and that's not yet all. We don't have uh, the package which we'll done yet, so I expect to have that done by the end of this month. And uh, we've got the door proposal under review by the door committee. What about support from Paul Bryant? I'm sorry? Uh, support from Paul Bryant, which of course is a bugging proposal. Usually I think we'll buy What about Paul Bryant? Uh, Paul consumes a debugging. Oh, so, right. Um, yeah, so there are other building tools that care about, mostly they care about debug line, and we left that in the so that stays in the 
the only case where you would be affected by this design is if you need to process um, inline files, if you want to be able to find inline files. Those are in the debug info, so you'll have to trace those over to the debug in order to do that. So yeah, there is some work to be done and other some of the things that BFD Morph.C is going to does some processing for um, for looking for inline file information. And that's on our that's on our list. It's not that does this mean you're going to be producing something like a lid dwarf for passing more info? That would be a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll have to, have to figure out something. So, continuing on, there are still redundant entries in debug added that we want to coalesce. We, what I found, there's one hanging fruit there that involves references to all the data of the old labels of the location list. And it's a fairly easy fix that I'm working on to, to do that. And I think that'll get almost all the duplication out of the dark matter. Beyond that, if we find that we still have significant duplications, then we're going to look at uh, building a hash table and right? making sure that we don't injure the same out of the same way twice. Then we want to replace GDB index with something better. But that's going to wait. Yeah, I'm for that, I don't want to go with something else yet to do. I want to wait for dwarf for many. And so we'll just go with what's already in GDB. Then there's another big thing. If you notice the, uh, let's say if you can see debug ranges, is the light green sort of sharp fruits. That's fairly large. And debug adder is fairly large. They're in the finalized get all. There's a lot of redundancy between those two things. In fact, a lot of the things in debug adder could have been expressed as offsets relative to a range. And range lists. Um, we've already taken care of by changing them from low high to low length. But uh, a lot of the entries in debug adder could be represented by a pointer to the debug range list entry and an offset relative to the, to the start of that range. So looking at that alternatively, um, debug ranges could be expressed in terms of debug adder. So they could just have pointers to entries so I got to look at both of those and compare the, the, uh, the various benefits and cost of the house. But I think we can eliminate, there's, there's redundancy between those two tables, and I'm, I'm working on uh, uh, trying to you know, squeeze out as much of that. So that's basically where we are now. Any questions? Have you considered on architectures where they have link time relaxation? Ranges you actually need to trick to be grown. Yeah. Well, that's why that's one reason we've left the option of, of using um, you know, range or start end versus start length. So we've got these um, architectures where you don't have the relocation, you can improve it to start length. On architectures where you do have relocation, you need all those labels and they can be Yeah. So who was the big old flaw that was uh, um, one, one, for practical. Well, it, you know, they had a solution that wasn't really, it, it, it wasn't blessed by Dwarf. It still involved uh, debug time relocation. They still had to apply relocations to, debug, to the debug info. And in that respect, it was just like HP and Sunday. You know, three different implementations, and the debugger had to, had to know which one it was dealing with. Find the link map and executable, figure out how to find the relocations based on that. Um, Apple's decent to die. I've talked with the LLM folks, uh, Eric Christopher specifically, and he's, he's interested in doing this. So we actually have work starting on the LLM side to put this efficient proposal there. Okay, the competition. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there's I was wondering a couple things. One is, is how it plays with um, G GC garbage collection in the linker. You know, right now the linker can say eliminate a particular static variable or something if no one ever uses it. And but you might have still have references left in the debug section because of that. Yeah. But with, we don't hurt or improve things. No, right. Yeah. We end up, we still leave um, 
null relocate, you know, we have relocations that result in a zero in the debug adder table that would have been a zero in the debug adder yeah, table. Yeah, uh, I mean, you could compress the table slightly if, if you knew that you could delete those. Yeah. But it, it, it occurs to me is, in, in listening to you that it's more that you're doing it after the thing, you don't really have an idea of where include files came from or the namespaces or whatever. It's just whatever the compiler happens to give you. And, you know, it may be that you get better debug information if you know, for example, everything is standard IO.h. You have one standard IO.h debug information rather than scattered in 300 modules. Mm -hmm. And more so in C++ where you have a namespace, you know, some sort of namespace aggregation so that if yeah. two people use the same namespace with integer arguments, it would become one, one thing rather than three things that have the same names and then throw them Yeah. Well, that, that was actually one of the earliest approaches to, come to uh, sort of trying to compress all the people you can info. Um, and that was actually canonized in the dwarf three spec, I believe. Mm -hmm. But it had the flaw that, that, that in order to do that, it meant that you actually had to hit all the people you info for your pedophile. And uh, in every compilation, you know, so that they'd all be identical, and you could just pick one and the others. But the compiler doesn't want to do that. The compiler wants to prune the debug info and invent only what got used in that compiler. Right. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, the big problem is that GCC doesn't break it into, you know, this came from standard I of that age, this came from whatever, in and out of the file, as I understand the debug info. Yeah, there is a GCC option to do that.
it's near part of the planet of the moon. Yeah. <laughs> what would incremental linking be a possible solution? It, it, we, we actually have that running. Uh, we're working on that. I'm actually finding that uh, incremental linking is going to help a lot more after I get this done. So uh, part of the problem with incremental linking is when you dug it from. One thing you want to do with, it, with incremental linking is leave holes into it in all the various sections for future compassion. And you can't leave holes in the debug info right now. Except with, with fission, I have the once you have an index, all of a sudden you can leave holes. So right now with incremental linking, when I have uh, holes, you know, to, in order to leave holes in the debug info section, I actually have to go fill them with dummy compilation hits. So the debugger doesn't get <laughs> And that means you know you can't you can't create a dummy compilation you know, smaller than what uh, 60 bytes or so. So that means I can't leave a hole smaller than 60 bytes. <laughs> so yeah, so I think once fish is done, I think we'll be able to make some improvements in the kernel game with the debugger as well. So you mentioned that we're using our style B to separate the uh, bug info from uh, the actual object code. Uh, is there any reason why it didn't just change the assembler to, to help with two separate files? Or? No good reason. Uh, it already was so much changes. Yeah. One, one, one thing it did help us to do was prototype it. So we, the, you know, the early prototypes that we did, we kept everything in the .NET files. So we were able to you know, experiment with the, with the actual changes without actually having to, um, without actually having to do the split and keep everything in the executable. Then it's just a matter of it, it's also easier to handle um, the references between the other sections and plugging if they're all going into the same assembly file. Then we could have we could have had the assembler just generate two output files because he was part of this building up. And compile time is not a problem for us. We, you know, we have massively parallel compiles. It's the link that you can have a single, you know, everything has to be a single file. So adding a little bit of extra time. Except, well, with yeah, with incremental updates, you're expecting fairly small changes. Um, so yeah, the the total amount, the total amount that we're adding, adding to one pile isn't all that significant. Um, it's if you if you have to serialize the whole build, then if you can parallelize it, then you have to have a size. But yeah, we do add a, if, if if you are interested in. I'm a single class step. We do have a little time How much do the GWO files look like else executables? Uh, I'm asking because DILIPC had some interesting issues with the separate web information that we use in Red Hat. Uh, as in people trying to get the, the debug information files to, to, to run with LDSO SO or something. And it would just crash. Well, the DWOs and the DWP files are just 